thank you all for coming. Uh, Hamni and Rose, thanks for organizing this. Um, I haven't actually taught for about a year. I uh, quit teaching last year because um, um, it became a little difficult to manage everything uh, with studio workload and uh, family and uh, teaching. I, even though I love teaching, uh, because I learned quite a bit from, from all the uh, new crowd, um, it, it took up a lot of time. Uh, and I'm quite invested in what I uh, take on, so I couldn't continue, unfortunately. Um, so I gave that up. Um, um, my practice uh, is about 10 years old, I would say. I graduated from the MFA program at UBC in uh, 2006. Um, and I've been at this practice seriously for 10 years. Uh, I used to have an instructor who said, give it a 10 year period and see what happens. If you're kind of undecided, then give it up. Um, I don't think there's been a moment that I've been undecided. Um, there have been times that it's been very difficult because you kind of want to realize um, an ambitious project and financially or space-wise, or for whatever reason, it's difficult to, to do that, and uh, you keep trying, and you come up with new tricks, and uh, you find people who share the same vision and make it happen. So I've been lucky enough to um, be supported by a lot of people, uh, and you'll see in my practice that people have a lot to do with my practice. I, I, when I talk to people um, such as uh, you guys, I use the word we. Um, I often talk about studio, studio work as we are working on this thing and people are like, who, who is we? Um, even though in, in my Persian uh, heritage, uh, the, the word, sometimes you use, you use we to refer to yourself. Uh, the Shah of Iran used to actually say we, and he would refer to himself as a grandiose uh, gesture, but uh, I am actually meaning we as me plus other people. Um, so I work uh, in a very strange kind of um, space in between um, sort of solo conceptualization of ideas and, and projects and collaboration. So there's a space between collaboration and what comes out of my head. Uh, and it's not a complete collaboration because um, in a way it's, my work is produced by a lot of people uh, with a lot of skills and craftsmanship and um, the ideas kind of come from me. Uh, if I have time and skills, I'm more than happy to do all of them. But usually, I'm lacking both uh, skills in particular. <laughs> uh, so I start with, with this uh, project that kind of launched off my career. <clears throat> I should say that my, my uh, studies at the university uh, were focusing, uh, or were focused on uh, early modernism. Uh, including the Bauhaus, the formation of the Bauhaus, and um, a, a kind of a narrow down on constr Russian constructivists. So I have an invested interest in um, in those two eras and the developments, and and what happened with the wars, and sort of how that affected the projects, both both of those projects. Um, <clears throat> so from 2008 to 2000. 12. Um, I was kind of lost in terms of where do I stand with, with my politics, with my creativity, with my medium, with my projects in general. And um, I kind of um, started working with these uh, nomadic carpets. Uh, and I had a lot of um, sort of interest and studies in, in space and architecture. In fact, for, for some of you, you know that that I started in Seattle, uh, in Shoreline. I used to live in Shoreline from 97 to 99. And I went to college doing architecture, and then I was lazy, so I quit that, and I moved to design, and then I took this course in ceramics, which was elective, and I just dropped everything else, and I became the shop boy for the ceramics students. For, for the ceramic studios, um, and I then joined a production potter, and I did some pottery, and from there I just moved moved to Vancouver and uh, did my BFA. So I have that kind of 
uh, history of being interested in, in space and architecture. So what you're looking at um, is, is a series of towers, or what looks like towers, uh, that have been extruded uh, directly from the patterns of these, these nomadic carpets. Um, in, in this work, I was very much um, interested in the negotiations and the, and the uh, sort of, uh, I don't want to use the word juxtaposition, but uh, the, the formal connections between the economies of the nomads and the economies of early modern. So I came, came up with these sort of foundational connections. One was uh, nomads, because they don't have the luxury of time, to develop certain patterns or whatever, they would reduce all the elements into basic elements. So you have a flower, uh, which could be developed really nicely over six months at the northern part of Iran or the Caucasus into a beautiful, what some call beautiful Persian carpet. With the nomads, they would have to kind of reduce that into very basic shapes. You re we still recognize them as flowers, but they're far from what's developed elsewhere. Um, in terms of colors, so these are all formal, formal aspects. In terms of colors, they used a lot of, uh, sort of again, elementary and basic colors. Um, the moderns are the same. So the reductivism of modernism as a pillar, uh, usage of color as, as basic colors, uh, use of geometry, and there's another one, abstraction. So these four pillars, for me, was the connecting point of these two things. Um, for this particular exhibition, we actually blew up some of the tiny elements in the miniatures into real scale. So I transformed the whole space into these <clears throat> kind of walls that didn't make any sense. Uh, but if you were to kind of follow the blueprint, you would start seeing um, certain shapes. So this is an example um, of, of an extrusion. And this one, you can actually compare that pattern to what's next to it. And you can see how I extrude them. Um, this is just to give a sense of scale. Um, out of that project came another one, uh, which I was really interested in um, Derrida's ideas around this concept that he called Paragon. He defined Paragon as, as two kind of, uh, as, as a combination of two words, par um, as in beyond, and ergon as a main kind of uh, body of writing. Uh, so paragon for him was defined as peripheral, peripheral works of a writer or a philosopher um, that are so important that, that, that without those peripheral texts, the main body doesn't make sense. So it's almost like decoding and decoding uh, that needs to happen. But he, ironically, he gives an example, of, a, a visual arts example or, or an art example. He uses frame as the um, example of uh, Paragon to describe it. So he, he would say, when you're looking at a picture, he calls paintings pictures, um, frame becomes part of uh, the wall, part of the architecture. And when you're looking at the wall, frame becomes part of the painting. So it has this shifting quality that, by that shift, it defines both the wall and, and, the, pic and the picture. So I took that and kind of ran, ran, ran off with it. Um, to produce these series of uh, uh, picture frames or what looks like a picture frame that are quite large in scale. Um, if I were to stand, my size would be around there. Um, that <clears throat> I kind of took a chunk out and made them incomplete. But by doing that, I exposed the uh, section cut. Um, and I shoved the section, I shoved the image or the picture that he kind of refers to into the construction of the frame. So you can kind of see, um, so this is an extrusion of uh, what you see as a shadow, which is a blue mosque in, in Istanbul. And a lot of the, the sort of silhouettes of these buildings that I use were sort of con contested uh, buildings that over time shift in function. So they had gone from being a basilica uh, to like a cathedral to a mosque to a museum um, or to a political venue. <clears throat> this is another example with the uh, with the Taj. Oh. Done. <laughs> um, I think 
I need help here. To, oh, okay. Something going on that I can't figure out. Anyways, um, so I'll um, from there I'll move into. No, I want to move into another project actually. I mean, I should have taken your advice and learn how to. Uh, there's another one. It'll come. Up. Um, <clears throat> so this this project is um, was commissioned by uh, Villa Stuck Museum in in Munich uh, last year. Um, they, the curator sent me a, a, an invitation, which was a really nice proposal. But I often get into these situations that I'm kind of pigeonholed as as a Middle Eastern artist or as an Iranian artist, and um, I think that kind of limits the reading of my work. So I try to push those out um, when I can and as much as I can. So this curator uh, nicely um, uh, wrote this proposal and sent it to me and I responded by another proposal, by, by an essay actually. And um, I, I explained to her what my problem is with the whole issue of sort of these surveys of Middle Eastern art. And I said uh, what the, the show was called Common Grounds. So it was kind of a generic uh, title. I took that and I said, what is actually common ground for me as an artist is the trades. So what kind of brings us together globally is the trades. And I like to work off of that idea. Um, and I proposed something really crazy that I thought, OK, they're going to email me right away and say, OK, thanks for your consideration. We are out. Um, I proposed to. Uh, get a container, shipping container, 20 foot long shipping container, and fill it with an installation that I, I proposed. And she wrote back and she was like, oh, we love it. We're going to put it on the third floor of the museum. I said, you do know that this is a 20 foot container. And it weighs quite a bit. And she's like, don't worry about that. And I really should have trusted Germans with that. So um, it ended up being titled uh, Los Opium Den. Uh, for those of you who are uh, familiar with early modernist sort of uh, uh, theories on architecture, you might know Loos. Uh, Adolf Loos was a Viennese architect who wrote um, an essay called Ornament and Crime. And he basically equated ornamentation with criminal activities. So an example that he gave was, if you have tattoos on your body, you either in the past have committed a crime, or you're thinking about doing it, or in the very near future you will commit a crime. And this is sort of a very radical kind of gesture towards Art Nouveau and Art Deco uh, that were sort of heavily invested in uh, labor that would result into ornamentation. But because this is the cusp of modernity, uh, at the cusp of modernity, he hasn't sort of, he doesn't know what modernity would look like. So even within his ideas of anti-ornamentation and whitewashing, he still uses certain things that we would consider ornamentation. Uh, for example, heavy loads of marble everywhere, and not just white marble, colored marble. Or carpets that are shaggy like that. Very, very kind of thick. Um, uh, anyway, so I, I, um, I've always kind of wanted to work with, with his ideas, and what I looked into was this particular house that he designed uh, right after he wrote the essay in, in uh, Prague. It's called Villa Müller, and it, he was commissioned to do that. So I took that, um, the floor plan uh, and sort of collapsed it, collapsed three floors of it, um, sort of conceptually, and created this uh, bookshelf out of the, uh, so that's essentially this, the floor plan when you look at it closely. Um, and I extruded it for about a foot, and we kind of erected it this way, so it became uh, uh, a bookshelf. Or better than a bookshelf, I think it's, it's a screen, like a room divider. And I was uh, very much interested in this idea of trade in relation to opium uh, with this particular project. So I essentially turned this container into an opium den. In opium dens, you usually have um, a, a screen or a divider that you can see through, but it gives you a semi-private uh, space. And that's very interesting, because politically, they, these screens 
played a huge role in, in exposing certain, certain politicians. Um, so what we filled the uh, bookshelf with, with was um, quite a bit of material from the original house. I actually found the researcher, the main researcher on, on the house, who was the head of the uh, architecture program at UBC. And uh, she had these boxes and boxes of material. And I borrowed, as much as I could, I borrowed uh, her stuff, including a piece of <laughs> original carpet. Um, and, and we put it there. So there were essays on uh, Lowe's in general, uh, his own writing, uh, essays on the house, and also a whole roster of books on trades and history of opium, whether it was uh, just uh, novels or, or um, sort of political looks at um, the history of opium. The, the pots, uh, we commissioned this guy in north of Germany who uh, agreed to do these, uh, these pots for us. I really wanted to have these pots. They were designed based on the opium bud, uh, so they're the shape of the uh, uh, poppy, poppy flower. Um, there is there's quite a bit to get into. I, d I don't want to uh, waste too much time on it. Um, and I covered the uh, the ground with with a lot of these Persian handmade Persian carpets. And um, it was there was a funny sort of incident that the guy who was giving us this these carpets um, had these little rugs. And there's a history behind these these little ones. They are handmade and they're from Iran. And uh, Iranians use them uh, as, as floor mats for their cars. So they could have a really shitty car, mm -hmm. but they would put a BMW or a Mercedes uh, floor mat on it. Um, and when I saw it, I was like, I have to have these because the headquarters of uh, BMW are in, in Munich. Um, and we had visitors from there, um, which was really fun. Anyways, um, so these are some, some more. Uh, Photos. These two carpets, uh, this one and this one, uh, belong to my own sort of collection. Uh, they're Afghan war carpets, uh, and I thought it's it's appropriate for uh, for the installation to to for these to be included in there. Um, and it was kind of a sort of a pause in the whole in the whole museum. You would go there and sort of sit down and chill out, and grab a book and go through it. Um, if you wish, or just sit down. It was, it was a cozy kind of uh, installation. Okay, I'm not gonna go there. Um, so I'm gonna close that. I'm gonna close that. And of course I don't have the other screen box. There we go. Uh, so prior to that, um, I should also mention that I gave up ceramics in 2003 because it was a very frustrating medium for me to push in terms of uh, having concepts connected to it that would go beyond the skills and, and material and the history that it was carrying. Uh, but it always had this urge to get back to it with, with a strong project. And I finally found a project that was convincing enough for me. So I'll go a little forward. Yeah, I'll stop here. Um, so there was an invitation by uh, West Vancouver Museum to do a solo show in 2013 <coughs> and I uh, proposed to do this show called Dialectic of Failure, sort of looking loosely at uh, the idea of dialectic of enlightenment with heavy um, sort of notation and reliance on, on uh, rationalization and, and reasoning and kind of looking at it from another perspective. What happens when reason and rationality fails? Do we have any, any, any ways of dealing with, with contemporary conditions at any moment in, in the history? Um, so that's one angle that I approached. The other angle was I, I've been fascinated by this artist um, from late 1800s, uh, American artist who is completely understudied and uh, some, considering, some consider him as the first abstract expressionist uh, from the 1800s. His name is George Orr. He was a, a, a potter. He was a ceramic artist in, uh, in Biloxi, Mississippi. So there's a, a really cool museum in Biloxi uh, that he shares with George O'Keefe. And it was just, it's designed by Frank Gehry. And there's a really great selection of works by him there. 
So this man um, would go to the banks of the river and dig his own clay, bring it to the studio, do the processing, and obsessively make pottery that are impossible to remake because he would throw them so thin and collapse them so they look like failed pots. In fact, the potters of the time didn't consider him a good potter because his pots were like lumpy and they collapsed and it, it seemed like he couldn't control it. It's impossible to redo what he has done. There are people who spend a lifetime trying to do that, they can't do it. Um, and he considered himself an artist, so when you, <coughs> when you go through his writings, he always considers himself a, a pottery artist. In fact, he would participate. This is the first documentation of an artist going to a fair as an art artist, like an art fair. He said, there's a photograph of him in a booth at a fair, that this is an art pottery booth. And uh, he was quite a bit of a character. And this is coinciding with sort of popularity of camera uh, in, in the States. And he would pose performatively in a very sort of uh, crazy way. Um, in front of the camera. So, for example, he had these long mustaches and, and a goatee that he would push to one side with all his hair, so to sort of um, simulate wind blowing. Uh, or, or he would just go on his head and balance himself on his head with pots on his feet and on his head. It's quite, quite a fascinating guy. Um, it wasn't until uh, Rauschenberg uh, started purchasing his collection that he, and, and painting actually part of his you see you see some of his uh, pots on Rauschenberg's paintings that he became actually uh, subject of study. So, anyways, I was interested in how he failed as an artist in his time uh, because all reasonings just failed him. Uh, and I kind of dedicated this project to him um, and made these pots that. They look raw because I didn't treat them with a the glaze. I didn't want to get into that subject of you know, surface decoration because I wasn't interested in it. I was interested in how pottery functions beyond cups and mugs and bowls and plates. Uh, so I gave them a function, but the function was for you to pick them up and scream into them. And they would silence you. Um, so that was their function. Some failed in completely silencing you. Some didn't. They were successful. But the function of them was to uh, be screamed into. And I made a lot of them. And uh, later on, I worked with a potter in Iran uh, who made about 50 of them for another exhibition, for a larger survey of, uh, of works. And uh, I gave him one example, and I said, can you just make similar to this? And he sort of replicated it 10 times, and he said, I won't work on this project. I'm an artist myself. Why should I copy somebody else? The curator called and said, he wants to do his own thing, are you okay with that? I said, give him parameters, let him run with it. He made the most amazing pots that I could have never made. So we have uh, some of those collections as well uh, there in Iran. So later, after that project, uh, the Vancouver Art Gallery approached and uh, they commissioned me for this public art piece. And uh, I thought of this, this space quite a bit. Um, it's a significant space right in the middle of downtown, uh, highest traffic uh, with business and travelers. Uh, it's next to the sort of fanciest hotel that we have. It's, this is the Shangri-La Hotel. Uh, Trump Tower is being built where you guys are sitting. Um, and there were new developments all around it. So this is actually like a void or, or like a shithole uh, in, in the middle of all this monstrosity. Um, and usually, uh, with the exception of maybe two artists in the history of this site, people have just used that flat surface to do something with it. Um, and I really wanted to activate this space. So I thought, originally I had a crazy idea that would have costed them a million dollars. And I thought, I can, through the work, I can actually raise that money. But they thought that the time span that they were interested in uh, wouldn't have worked. Um, and I got kind of upset and kind of left it because I'd worked so hard on that proposal. And two weeks later, um, I called up the curator and I said, you know, what about the pots? And she's like, yes, that's what we wanted, but we didn't want to tell you. <laughs> um, 
And I said, sure, that we can. I can probably install like five or six of them large scale. And they're like, we love it. We'll send you the contract. I hung up the phone. I'm like, how the fuck am I going to make these? Because they're six feet. And they're going to be outside for six months, exposed to elements. There are two major events happening on this street that this is going by, including fireworks and um, actually three events. Uh, one of them would be a run, like a marathon. And I was like, OK, for sure something is going to happen to these. Nothing happened. Um, but people are actually getting engaged with it. So these are also doing the same function. Uh, people finally had a platform uh, to go on and, and scream. And it was OK, because it was an artwork. It allowed them to do that. And I really, um, I really enjoyed uh, the whole process. So I actually hired a ceramic artist that I graduated with. And um, he was always criticized by our, by our professors as making these big, dumb pots. And I really wanted to make them make those dumb pots do something. So this is the installation called Time to Let Go. Um, um, you can see kind of other angles and views. Um, I'll move on to another uh, series of works. Um, this is called the, the Return Project. Um, so you can see my, my sort of, I don't have a particular subject. Recently, I've become more and more interested in disappearing art, like art that's inaccessible, or the actual object, the disappearance of the actual object, um, but with residues. So um, in 2014, I had this idea that I want to go purchase, I want, well, I had a kid in 2014. So as part of fatherhood, I was strolling this kid into different places, uh, including shopping malls. And at the same time, I was sort of reading uh, a little bit of uh, Benjamin's work on the, on the creation of the arcades and um, sort of the problem of this world that's sort of shifting, everything that's coming into one place as opposed to these uh, leisurely trips that we take to get our shoes repaired in one neighborhood and then go pick up a croissant or whatever somewhere else. Uh, and they're all in one building. And that was a problem. So, and I was, I was kind of experiencing this. I was experiencing the arcade with, with a little kid. And I, I've always been interested in, in um, the notion of um, a flaneur, someone who has the luxury of strolling around the streets in Paris and, and enjoying life, but also as a critical person who has that time to re reflect and respond. Um, so I was literally strolling <laughs> with a stroller um, and going through aisles of different department stores. Um, so I started getting engaged with certain objects in these places that they sell. And most of the time being really revolted as to why they even bother producing these things, let alone selling it, let alone who buys these things. And so I ended up buying them. Um, so there's a formula overarching this, this whole project, the return project. I purchase an object that I'm engaged with. Um, I bring it to the studio and photograph it the way it is. In this case, it's the uh, hand-carved African mask. Um, Modifying the object, uh, and usually the modification has to do with me cutting a piece off of them. So technically, the weight and the length or the measurements of what I purchase is different to the piece after modification. And I photographed the modified image. In this case, is um, I commissioned the uh, First Nation souvenir carver to turn it into uh, a, a sort of a Northwest Coast. Uh, motifs, um, and, but on the way I cut the chin, which is there, and I cut the head, which is there, um, and I photographed <coughs> the modified object again. With the receipt of the original, uh, I take the modified object back to the store for my money back. Um, but before doing that, I authenticate those these works as unique works of art. So there is always a note accompanying what I return, that these, this is a unique work of art signed and dated. <clears throat> and 
And I'm left with a before and after photograph to scale, uh, and what I call an orphan object, orphaned collage object. Um, photos have their own title. The object has its own title, but they're one piece. So in this case, photo is called From Africa to the Americans. Uh, the object is called To Cubism. And what this project has allowed me to do is um, to kind of look at subjects that I have always wanted to deal with. Uh, but I felt like, oh, maybe I'm not allowed to enter that kind of uh, subject. Or um, maybe uh, uh, it's not politically appropriate to do that. So under the umbrella of the formula of the return project, I'm, I'm able to do this. How does this? Oh, there we go. So this is a sort of close-up of this. Um, this is actually in reverse. This should be here, and this is there. Um, this one, the photographs are called uh, Brancusi's Alien Fascination, and, and this piece is called uh, Constantine which is Brancusi's first name, and this is the detail of it. Um, so this piece was, um, there were a pair of these that I purchased. They're these um, Indonesian uh, mask, dance masks, like a ritual mask, that have been kind of caricaturized um, and put in this, these stores, like a, it's almost like a discount store that I found this at. Um, <coughs> you guys have TJ Maxx? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, so it's a sister company of TJ Maxx uh, called Winners. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I get almost offended. Like, I take it personally that the history of this culture has to be reduced and caricaturized to, uh, to this object that would sit somewhere in somebody's house. Um, so I sanded, sanded it to the point of beyond, being beyond recognition and sort of made it look like this. Uh, but there was a little bird in, in, uh, in the middle section, so I cut that off and turned it into that. Um, commissioned um, someone who usually works with me to make this sort of bronchusi like um, sculpture or replica of the uh, endless column. And I thought this actually looks like bronchusi a little bit with the, with the bulgy eye. And, and it's, um, so you can see how subjects are shifting. In this, within, the, within the same project. Um, IKEA sells these prints that they look like watercolor. Um, again, I get offended. <laughs> uh, but I understand that they actually can sell watercolor because they would have to employ so many people to actually make watercolor. Um, so I bought this one, which is a, a peony, an illustration of a peony flower, but they go ahead and they put this really nice calligraphic text on the bottom that looks like an artist's signature, but it was actually like a biological term for, for the peony species. Uh, so I decided to give them a real watercolor. So I took this print out, replaced it with my own watercolor, but I gave them a dissection of a poppy flower, which you get opium from, um, and, and heron, I think, comes from that as well, right? Okay, um, so this is this is the watercolor. It's signed and it's it's a unique work that they brought back. Oh, I don't have the photo of this guy. Sorry. Um, so I cut out uh, because this is a cardboard essentially. I cut that flower out, uh, put it in a bottle, water bottle um, that had the water from the watercolor, and uh, put two straws in there. So essentially, it's sort of trying to replicate a street made a uh, bomb, like an opium or, or a cracked bomb or whatever. Uh, my studio also is right next to um, a shelter at, uh, in Vancouver, and I, I get influenced quite a bit by what I see. Um, <clears throat> this one, uh, again, back to Ikea. <laughs> um, they sell these candles in many sizes, um, th but they miss one. So uh, they, they had them in 4 inches, 6 inches, 8 inches, and 12 inches, but for some reason they don't have 10. Uh, so I melted this one down in a pot for, for 2 inches. And um, I basically, because wax is a very basic sculpture medium, um, I uh, casted my hand in this 
sort of form, and the wick is here. Um, so the <coughs> photos are called um, uh, tearless. The, the candles are called tearless. And the hand is called Never Forgetting Richter. Um, Gerhard Richter has this uh, painting that I can't stop looking at every time I'm, I'm uh, exposed to it. It's a candle that's burning and it's sort of, it's like a photograph that's blurry, uh, which he's known for. Uh, and it's his homage to the Holocaust. And I, I find that piece so powerful that I kind of wanted to give another homage, but not just to Holocaust, but to um, um, to the sort of memory of the survivals and, and what happened in the Holocaust, but to, to this artist. And the gesture of the hand, um, uh, sort of, it, it's ambiguous, but for me, it, it's the hand of the painter. Um, uh, and there, there are references to this, this gesture of the hand by Albert Dewar and, and uh, some other painters that kind of um, have done, done self-portraits with this, with this gesture. Uh, this is a yoga mat. Uh, as you probably know, Vancouver is notorious for yoga. That tells you how much problems we have. Um, and so there's a store called London Drugs that sells everything. And I found this yoga mat, um, and I laser cut the word run and rolled it back. And I've become a little bit more sophisticated than the beginning of, the, of this project. Now I have tools and equipment, like an industrial shrink wrapper. So I, I like shrink wrapping. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. You shrink wrap anything, they'll take it back. It's almost like the ultimate legitimizing tool. Um, uh, yeah, so it's missing that word. And it's out of my own, I shouldn't, I shouldn't make fun of it. It's out of my own experience of yoga studios that it just feels like people run into the mat and run out. It's like, okay. <laughs> um, and, and the object that goes with it is, uh, is urn. So these are actually light boxes that sit on the floor. Um, so they glow slightly. It's not too bright, but they glow slightly. Um, and as you can see, the, the, I'm not a photographer at all. In fact, I have a very strong position, um, critical position on photography, not against it, but on photography. Uh, but this project relies heavily on photography. And I've done all the photos myself, but I'm not too picky with photos. Like, I just need it for its basic job, which is, for me, documentation. Um, but they're all treated differently. So this one is, is a uh, print on Duratran, and it's got a matte finish uh, to kind of um, suggest uh, tombstone. Um, these ones are printed on watercolor paper. Um, and yeah, uh, this one is on uh, metallic paper, and it's it's actually quite a beautiful uh, object. I didn't know you, I, that I could do this. It's trans-mounted, which means there's glass um, attached to the photo, and behind it there's a piece of metal. That it, it's, so it's, it's a flat thing. It's not framed. The frame that you see is the photo. It's in the photo. Um, and um, these ones are just C-prints. Uh, this one is also on metallic. But I've done... I've done every paper that's available based on the idea. Uh, I think that's that for, oh no, there's this one too. So this one is called um, The Rise of the Sun, The Fall of the Sun, The Rise and the Fall of the Sun. And this is sort of looking at the decline of the Japanese culture. Also from Ikea, they, they sell <coughs> these round floor mats for $6.99 and they sell half of it for $4.99. So go figure. So I returned half, uh, and I kept half. So, uh, so that's that's that project. Um, and this is something that I'm involved with right now. Um, I'm involved in three projects at the moment. One is sort of uh, extending the return project. I don't think I'll get tired of it because there's quite a diverse subject that the subject matter and. Uh, form that I'm interested in exploring. Um, there is another project that I'll share with you guys a little bit. Uh, uh, I'm producing 12 time capsules uh, that have a term of 100 years. Uh, so these time capsules can't be opened 
for 100 years. If they're open, um, the value for them culturally or monetary is zero, as, as it's declared by me. Um, but what you see as a capsule is an art form itself. Inside, you see another one. So we're producing one now, which is a painting. Uh, inside this frame uh, that's uh, welded metal with a frosted bulletproof glass. So you can't actually see what's in there, but I can reassure you that there is a painting in there. Um, if you want to open this, you have to actually destroy the frame. And that kind of, uh, it's a dilemma that I'm very much interested in. There's another one that we just finished uh, doing is a little sculpture, it's a bronze sculpture inside a kid's carry-on luggage that gets dipped into wax, so it gets completely sealed. And there's another one that I'll share with you, because we're producing this one in Italy. There's a sort of a tube that, that has something, and we're embedding this tube inside a wheel of Parmesan cheese before they seal it. So that's, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, the third project, which I've been working on for about a year and a half, and I have at least another year to go, is called <clears throat> La Collection Imaginaire. Uh, I'll, I'll be showing four or five of them very soon in, in Seattle at Inca, and this is the first time that they'll be launched. Um, so I've, I've engaged artists uh, across Canada, uh, and some international, but, but the first phase of it is focusing on Canada, because I kind of want to see what my contemporaries are doing and sort of expanding the context of my own practice. Um, so I'm engaging them in a dialogue, and this dialogue can be 12 or 15 or 20 studio visits. We go back and forth. So it's founded on studio visits. Um, and what comes out of it is, um, is, is an exchange of works. So exchanging works has historically happened for, for centuries between artists. Um, but I'm also interested in um, sort of how I can turn that into a project. Uh, so it, keep, keep the idea of this appearing object in mind. Um, and you, you could see it in the time capsule, you could see it in the uh, return project. Um, so once we have a sort of a conviction between me and the other artists that the subject of our dialogue or conversation is kind of narrowed down to one thing that we're both really passionate about, we find two works that speak to that, and then we exchange. Um, so monetary valuation is out of the window. Medium is out of the window. Uh, gender is out of the window. Uh, social status, cultural status is out of the window. Everything that, we can kind of wait, uh, that I have issues with, they're out of the window. Uh, it just boils down to these conversations. Um, so we exchange the works. It, in this case, you can see an embroidery by uh, a Toronto-based artist named Fazal Um exchanged exchange with uh, a Persian carpet that um, I, I turn into a monochrome. I, I paint these valuable uh, Persian carpets to kind of uh, deface them. So I, I kind of destroyed them, but then the valuation of the work just goes off the roof, which, again, logically doesn't make any sense, but that's the reality. <coughs> So we've kind of done this. Um, so what happens is that this is a good example. I have only three examples at the moment um, of what actually happens. Um, so these two photos that you're looking at, this one is taken by me in my house uh, of her work. And this is taken by her of my work in her domestic space. So I require them um, to photograph my work in their possession. And I get the permission to do the same with their work. These two photos act as photo art, essentially. Um, they're editioned three times, um, and they are, the second and third edition would be available for sale at the galleries that I work with. When they're sold, my galleries are only entitled to 30% commission. The other artists would get 30% and I get 30%. Uh, and then the remaining is basically for framing or processing or shipping or whatever, just admin works. Um, so I'm actually surveying uh, contemporary Canadian art at the moment, and on the way I'm building probably one of, I don't, mean, I don't want to sound cocky, I really believe it, that I'm building one of the best collections of contemporary Canadian art. Um, uh, I've done 38 so far, and I'm projecting between 80 to 100 exchanges, uh, which means I would basically 
have to say goodbye to 100 works out of my inventory, um, which is, at this point, I can say it's completely fine because I've convinced myself that this project is worth culturally and monetary uh, enough to, to be able to do that. Um, so, yeah, you can kind of peek through these domestic spaces um, <coughs> and get a bit of a context of, of uh, where artworks go. Um, this is a uh, photo was taken by me uh, of uh, a photographer that I respect a lot. We graduated in the same year, uh, Michael Love. And that's a drawing um, that Mike got from me in, in their space, and that's, that's a photo by him. Um, so this one <clears throat> is a photograph of this uh, youth camp in Ukraine uh, that he visited. And it used to be ran by Stalin, and now it's run by the, the, you know, the wealthies. So they actually send their kids there for summer, for summer camp. But um, this, this slide is not that great. This is uh, Lenin, and he's still there. And this tiny thing here, it's, I don't know if you can see, you can see it a bit better here, uh, is a person. So this is a massive, massive monument of Lenin. So I, I really love this piece, and this is a very big photograph. Um, part, partially because of the memory um, that gets constructed around the monument. And what I proposed to him is a drawing of their apartment. Um, I do these drawings based on people's houses and, and apartments, based on my memory. So I visit it once and uh, go away after a few weeks I attempt to redraw it. And I actually fuck this one up. Um, there, is, there is no hallway here. Um, and I, I remember the hallway, and he's like, oh, there's a hallway there. I'm like, oh, fuck, sorry, I, I'll, I'll do another one. And they're like, no, 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 that's exactly how we want. Um, so that's what they got. So again, they're working off of memory. This is uh, a work by um, a photographer uh, named uh, Ryan Peter. Do you guys know Ryan? Yeah, you know Ryan. Yeah, Ryan and I are in the same studio building, so we have a lot of conversations back and forth. Um, uh, we've had it for a good year and a half around the works. Um, and Ryan, I'm, I'm really fascinated with how he um, approaches photography. He does this really elaborate process of exposing light to sensitive uh, photo paper. Uh, but what he uses to create these things are a series of painted surfaces. Like uh, he, he spray paints um, nylon. Say, like plastic, plas plastic sheets, and then does his thing, and then all of a sudden they look like a tree when they're exposed um, with light. So it's quite, quite a beautiful piece that I got. Ironically, we we took we installed the works in a very similar setup, and this is happening a lot. Um, so there is this kind of narrow opening, and we're both installing uh, next to a door and a window. Um, that that piece is a lenticular piece. Um, are you guys familiar with that medium, lenticular? It's those postcard, cheesy postcards that you move and the image moves, you know? It's a very old technology, uh, and it's almost disappearing. Um, that piece is a square that when you walk in front of it, it moves. Uh, so kind of reminiscing um, Mecca, the, the house of God for Muslims in Saudi Arabia, that Muslims are supposed to kind of circumnavigate, I don't know how many times. Uh, so I, I like to bring it home, save, save the trip to Saudi Arabia. Uh, but anyways, that also kind of ch is channeled through Malavich's Black Square. Uh, so I always kind of work with, with multiple subjects. That's it. That's the end of it. Thanks. <laughs>
with not only shape and form, etc., but with sound, like in your Jose Fayot, that's incredible. And uh, with interaction with the youth. Mm -hmm. I, I should just uh, translate what you said because she said the um, screen pot in Farsi. Mm -hmm. And um, I worked with a <coughs> semiotician from Iran as we were publishing a sort of a, uh, <coughs> what's the word, um, a thorough publication, like a book. Mm -hmm. uh, and he wrote one of the essays and he came up with a word for them. He called oh. them, yeah, he called them Jihdan, mm -hmm. which. Uh, it doesn't exist in Farsi, he just made it up and it makes perfect sense. In, in Iran? In Iran, yeah, he's Iranian. He's, uh, he's the semi semiotician that we have. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a really beautiful essay on it. Um, uh, yeah, the reception for the show in Iran was incredible. I, I went home with fever. 650 people showed up to the opening. Wow. And um, everybody was engaged. Like. You think people would be hesitant to you know, pick up a piece of ceramics, but even in West Vancouver, West Vancouver is notorious for um, having a senior demographic. There are a lot of um, people in, in their late senior uh, uh, years, and they would just come to the openings because that's their place to go. Like they've been doing that for twenty some odd years, and they came. And, and they're also very conservative. They came and there was this table with all these pots and they went right into it. They picked it up and got engaged. And it's, it's interesting that you, you work with a medium that has a domestic sort of uh, connotation and, and people are, are receptive. It's very interesting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's very interesting because um, I don't know if you saw that photo of the lady mm -hmm. with her head in it. It almost feels like it's it's yeah, one. Good. Either she's going in or kind of mm -hmm. coming out. Um, sound, your voice does that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So part of the essay actually deals with that. Thanks. That was a really that was a really nice talk. Um, I'd be curious to hear a little more why. Early 20th century, like why you're drawn so much to that time in hmm. European history. Mm -hmm. um, I guess lots of reasons. One, uh, I think formally and aesthetically, I'm very drawn into. If I'm completely honest, I'm very much interested in in um, how they moved away from certain aesthetics and they kind of created this new thing. Um, and either they didn't use any references that were known, or they were really smart in hiding the references, so it was completely new. And one thing that I'm very adamant with, with art, is <coughs> we, can, we can probably hopefully see that in my work, is that I consider art as a practice. Um, it, for me, it ends when I stop breathing, for, for my practice. Um, and maybe I'm actually, I just, it just clicked that maybe uh, the time capsules are trying to actually extend the life of me. But <laughs> um, I think, yeah, it's the, it's the eruption that I'm interested in. Like, all of a sudden, there is this development that abrupts the history, but it gets abrupted also by another history, which is war. Like, I was always interested in why, when you come out of a war situation that you almost perished, and your whole generation almost perished, why would you move to the States and continue the same project? Why would you not reflect what had just happened to you? So when I was younger, as an artist, I was like pissed off. Like, respond to that, you know? Why would you continue? continue the modernist project. And then it clicked that it was, they were doing that. They were essentially doing that, but this is what they could do. And they didn't have the time to reflect, actually. It was very quick. Um, so that's one thing. Um, with the Russians, I was also interested in how they were engaged politically and what happened to them politically, like the rise and the fall. Uh, and all of these fascinations with monument. So I've done a lot of works 
under the sort of the disguise of monumentation, but they're this big. Like I call this a monument. In a return project, I have one, uh, which I didn't show you. That's called uh, a monument to the Cold War. And it's this big. It looks pathetic, um, but it does carry on all those uh, things that they were interested in. Uh, so Malovich and, and Lizitsky in particular, I, I was quite drawn into because of their, their journey, their, their practice. And later on, I found out that Malovich did these, uh, what he called architectons. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Mm -hmm. They almost are identical to the towers that I make mm -hmm. uh, without a reference. Like, he wouldn't have a reference. He would just do them as forms. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question. It's a good question. But yeah, that's that's great. Thank you. Uh, I, I also studied Duchamp heavily, as you can probably tell, mm -hmm. uh, and all his kind of uh, gameplays and uh, connections to other artists. Like recently, I found out that um, a major part of why we actually know Brancusi is because of him, because he actually collected his work. Mm -hmm. His first show in the States was curated and put together by and supported financially by Duchamp in New, in New York. Mm -hmm. We know about the bird in, uh, in space sculpture that was coming here and it got s s <coughs> stopped at, at the customs. And we always know that Brancusi won that battle. He didn't sue the customs. Duchamp sued the customs and he won. Mm -hmm. um, Brancusi was at the court, but yeah. Uh, yeah, anyways. One of your time capsules, you put it in a wheel of Parmesan cheese. Yeah. Is it supposed to last 100 years? Yeah, so funny thing is that um, there is this thing called Cheese Bank. Have you heard of it? <laughs> <laughs> so um, you go to Cheese Bank with a wheel of cheese, and they keep it for you. They loan you money uh, to start a small business, and they keep it there. Um, for as long as you can repay them with interest. And they do that because value actually goes up every year for, for a wheel of cheese, because it ages. Yeah. But we're not interested in cheese being uh, lasting. I'm interested in, in the form. Even if it rots in there, I'm fine with that. We're taking, we're taking that piece to an uh, artissima art fair. And my dealer is, is so funny. He's like, I can't wait until the, I stink up that whole booth. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, Italians will get it. So, like comparing the return project to your previous earlier works, um, I'm curious to find out like, how important was the negotiation between you and the gallery or the curator it was carried down into the return project? Because it seems, it seems to me, there's a heavy uh, thing on value and everything, but there's also this negotiation between the gallery or, you know. Um, In terms of what they receive? Yeah. Or, or as artworks? Or your process, yeah. As artworks. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the valuation is at the core of the return project uh, because <clears throat> one artwork gets disappeared um, and you can come upon it and buy it for like five bucks or ten bucks. Um, and that story we're familiar with, every like four years or five years, someone opens a garage and there are five Picassos. Whoa, right? So that disappearance for a time period, I'm interested in. I'm not interested so much in who buys them and where they end up and monitoring that. I'm not even interested in documenting when I go and perform this return. Um, but I'm interested in the system that's in place that would allow an artist to show or to put together this configuration of a diptych photograph using the language of art like photography and certain kind of printing and framing and all that stuff, titling, everything. And with this little object, sometimes you know it's literally a plastic bottle, right? Um, and that gets sold by the gallery. And what I've done, because I'm not interested in valuation that shifts with the subject, like I'm not interested in selling the African mask for 
fifteen thousand dollars selling brown cozy for eighteen. I'm not interested. So they actually got flat price for all of them. Every single return project um, is is uh, priced one number, uh, and that's absurd. That is absurd to me. That I can I can get that valuation, and I've been getting a lot of that. Hence, I can actually produce other works. Yeah. These ones are going to be pretty affordable, though. <laughs> Conceptually, it's important to do that for me because I want them to be disseminated to as many places as possible and as quickly as possible. Because it's just not me who's involved. There are other artists involved as well. And it's, it's, a, it's a new economical model for me. Do you have a, do you have a long, longer term plan for the collection that you're making? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the first, uh, the first edition of the photos, I keep all of them, because I want the whole set to be sold to a museum. And I'm in negotiations already with them. Uh, and the collection, I'll be donating at some point. But I ha I'm in no rush, and I have to find the right place for it. And that's part of, okay, so one thing, one major thing that I forgot to mention, actually, is that a lot of the artists that I'm in dialogue with, some of them I don't know at all. So I go and I say, hi, I'm this, and they sometimes know who I am. And can I do a studio visit? And we do a studio visit, and I get to know them that way. But I know their work from distance, so I get to know what's behind it. Some of them are quite well known, and I am using their generosity, in a way, because they're, they're more established than I am, uh, to support the, the whole project and the rest of the artists. Some of them are, and this is probably a good bulk of it, they're completely overlooked. And I, I, I think I'm qualified enough uh, to recognize the practice and see that it's valuable critically and it's overlooked. Um, so the bulk of it is, is that. There are also artists who um, have, at some point in their history of practice, uh, for whatever reason, they've sort of put art practice to the side and they've joined the infrastructure of the art. So I have a curator, for example, one of the curators who is involved in the project, uh, who used to be a photographer, showed next to a... a, a <coughs> At 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 or at at Gen? This is my history of photography. I'm very cool with that. So in in NASCAP, like they're not uh, you know jokey artists. Uh, National Gallery, for example, owns uh, from the same series that I now have. Um, but he's a very well known curator in Canada. He's in fact the kind of photography curator uh, in in Canada. Grand Toronto, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and there are artists who have uh, been in institutions, for example, not mental, but uh, <laughs> in, uh, in, in education, you know, they've been teachers, deans of departments, um, and I think that's value, it's, it's really valuable, for me it's very valuable, so that's what I want to say. We can also have a more casual and relaxed conversation. Are we going for a drink? Or? Uh, <laughs> Our drinks coming. <laughs> See, I exposed your plan. We have drinks here, but we're going to grab uh, some food or dinner. Yeah, or okay, drinks cool. afterwards. Cool. Thank you.